Hello everyone, today we talk about the flags of the Teutonic Knights. And you know that every once in a while I cover this topic of for completeness essentially because I think they are actually pretty interesting things, even the visual approach is to, to these works of art, not just military instruments at the end of the day. Uh, it's quite important. There is all an anthropology and history of art behind these things for, for those who know about it. I am no expert, but I think it's it's fascinating to to look at this uh, aspect of war that we offer overlooked, like how much colored was actually a medieval battle uh, compared to the usual idea that you know everything was kind of gray, uh, kind of dark, iron-looking something like it was all colorful, extremely colorful. Even the same armor um, was polished. The coloring itself was dramatically important for tactical purposes at the time. Um, the incredible color variety had to do in many ways with the degree of political fragmentation of these armies and how they were levied, organized. The Teutonic Ogdenstadt was actually very uh, efficient in its regard. It's actu it was actually one of the most centralized uh, political um, entities existing in Europe at the time, since an early age. Mm -hmm. Today we really concentrate, as we will see, on a very peculiar um, example, which is the one of the Battle of Grunwald, or Tannenberg, if you prefer to call it like that, 1410. So this major uh, defeat of the Teutonic Order at the hands of the Poles, uh, Lithuanians, um, that basically saw the fall of many of the Teutonic flags and banners in the hands of their foes that basically decorated um, the Krakow Cathedral in southwestern Poland with these uh, with this spolio of war, um, and that were, by the way, captured by by the Nazis in 1940, as far as I know, and brought back to Germany as the symbolism of this revival of the Drang nach Osten, right? Um, so these uh, in the push towards the the east and uh, the recovery of the German lands that also in, in, in Poland of the time and actually. Uh, being in fact occupied after World War the first so all the, the you know this deep and, and harsh uh, feelings actually that uh, ethnically speaking have um, bloodened let's say central and, and Eastern Europe um, and that have brought away a lot of history with them if anything for the destructions that every war brings forward and especially World War the second as we know in its most dramatic outcome, um, there are a lot of questions, a lot of issues related to this. We, we, we will not comment on them also because on Schwerpunkt we had never talked about contemporary history. We could start doing it at one point, but uh, for now I'm just building it v around medieval medieval history. Um, the point though is that, in fact, there is a, th this is kind of pertinent at the same time because there are deeper meanings actually attached to what we see as a simple banner. Of course, everybody knows that. that the insignia, whichever they are, are really uh, a living part of the Esprit de Corp, if not actually overlapping with it and having deep anthropological, historical, cultural meanings uh, that you can see, in fact, still in, in this heraldry, in this uh, sim symbolism, that we, we have lost the ability to interpret, right? And um, unfortunately, I'm not going to do it for you today because maybe we'll have to discuss this phase in, in detail at one point, always bearing in mind that heraldry is actually as a science is born in the modern age, not in the middle ages. In the middle ages everything was all very fluid, right? Uh, there wasn't... Uh, the example actually of, of the German-Polish relations in, the, in this centuries of the low middle ages are very very fascinating because there was a lot of blending of many symbolisms, of many even of many names, battle cries, you know, uh, in the area it's uh, dramatically fascinating to look at the um, Germano-Slavic relations in, in this context in many of these countries. We try to cover that on Schwerpunkt on a regular base, at least every once in a while. Um, but always bearing in mind that when, when you see this, it's, it's not just a mechanic, it's not just, um, you know, merely functional thing. There is, uh, I mean, it is always, but it, it has to do not just with the material object per se, but also with its the, the spiritual meaning of it, right? Truly spiritual at one point, because the Teutonic Order's, you know, 
probably mo one of the most it's monastic order, one of the most evidently religious orders in this regard. But warfare at the time was religious by definition, like every single uh, country, every single um, town, every single uh, guild had its own patron saint, right? In the case of uh, of the Teutonic Knights, in particular, it was the Virgin Mary. Um, that figure, in fact, prominently uh, also in their iconography, they are produced beautiful art in this regard. Um, and there is much more that ha also has to do with the sensorial experience of the battle uh, at all levels, including the musical one, the Teutonics, uh, uh, as we will see. Um, the Teutonic Knights had the actually this habit that wasn't really exclusive, but had a particular um, even there is particular evidence for them of musical uh, of the use of musical instruments such as organons, for example, and, uh, and very dramatically. So and it's very fascinating, and should get close to you know Aquinas very you know remotely though because too much uh, too much water has passed under bridges let's put it in this way poetically uh, from for now but to this idea that symbolism is really part of, uh, of a deep spiritual nature that all people had in a way or another at the time it was mixed of course with superstition it wasn't you know th that was not really a beautiful world in which to live uh, as it's evident but at the same time it it's very meaningful because it shows you also what brought these people to in this case to risk their lives to fight to die right in the name of certain symbols of certain ideas that were functional to broader things to their politics to their society right much of it is kind of uh, ideal right it's always been ideal but still I it's a part of yourself uh, in many ways it's um it's as if you think about your surname, think about your family name, the idea that you belong. I, I know today we're we have undergone this mo process of radical secularization and modernization. Some some people don't even care about a anymore. But that's the, the still the need of purpose and meaning is you know as long as it's um, positively oriented. I think it's it's very it's very important um, in many ways. And also also always realizing that we have to contextualize, not to think that these symbolisms were sh should be projections of what we should do today because these people were living in the 15th century we live in the 21st right so we can't um, bridge this gap as if you know there was no difference whatsoever um, so the topic of flags is also par particularly overlooked when we talk about tactics in general there are certain uh, rules of the Templars for example that, that tell us quite explicitly that, that they're actually the most important source in the topic on how uh, flags and banners were used in battle um, if for the sake of actual signaling and tactical coordination. And this was of fundamental importance, especially for um, certain warfare that were uh, w that were, were very dynamic, that had to do especially with cavalry but not only in the chaos of a battle a lot of things can happen and these banners were definitely um, are actually a very powerful indicator right of the of certain in fact tactical and also organic aspects that we have to take into consideration when observing the actual composition and fun uh, function of these armies right um, and it's obvious that also Teutonic Knight armies were invariably organized under individual banners on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. There were there, there was a hierarchy of them. There were there were the big banners uh, that you know usually uh, were borne by the uh, by the the the, lead, the 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 commander, the main commander, and his staff. Let's say, and were other flags for the divisions and smaller ones for uh, squads or. Uh, etc squadrons etc and uh, we want to expand it on this either but for a quote that is very fascinating from the Livonian rhymed chronicle that is a work if I'm not wrong from the 14th century that however starts to talk about uh, the history of the uh, Baltic Crusades from the 12th century um, that says quote uh, after the native troops of Courland and Semigallia had joined them the um, the Teutonic Knights, the master and his advocates and the crusaders deemed it time to group the people under various banners, as is the custom 
in war. When they arrived at the frontier, the advocates regrouped their forces and drew them up for combat. The banners were entrusted to those who were eager for battle and who knew how to conduct themselves in such matters. Although there were many banners, the natives were so well trained that they would not stray, uh, stray from their own. Right? Um, and uh, this shows you essentially how the, the Teutonic Knights were framing these auxiliary troops of these Baltic lands they had come to, to occupy um, under banners, right? And this thing went on, it, it shows you from one side that it says as is the custom in war, so obviously this was done basically by every army at the time, um, albeit it's possible that there were uh, certain societies, especially like these tribal ones, and uh, the Chronicle is talking about that, yeah, they had a military organization, they had their banners, their standards and whatever, but they weren't framed maybe in the same organic fashion the you know, Teutonic Knights needed them to be at least at, at that point. So what they do is they give them banners um, to organize themselves and this operation is carried out um, I mean the, the operation framing these troops under the, the banners and the various commanders by those here it says we were more eager to, to fight uh, right and they knew essentially how that thing was done already. So we find even among these populations naturally who knew had more military experience, we knew what was the world matter. And this thing of the banners was of dramatic importance because the banner is essentially what uh, your reference point during the battle. Right? It's something you can't see up in the air over the dust, uh, over the, the, the mass of people fighting. And that's what you have to revert to uh, in moment of uh, of difficulty, of re uh, simply, you know, coming back from, from the melee where uh, yeah, as you know, that lasts very few, actually. Um, so these battles could last even a, an entire day. The, the same battle of Grunwald lasted like 10 hours or something like that. So you can imagine this need to maintain cohesion uh, around your, your standard to just as the most element form of security as under it, where all the people fundamentally you know, you're not organized by chance in the battle, uh, formations, their cohesion revolves also around the internal disposition of the troops that are not chosen by, by chance, right? Armies, had the, the phase of the deployment and the composition of, of the ranks is the single most important thing when you are preparing for battle at, at that unit level, right? And um, you you must know what you're, you you have on your left and your right in front of you because you you're used to to have that as a point of reference during the fight. The same goes for the banner. That is the most evident and uh, and and actually the uh, really the the symbol that probably the individual troops are more attached to at, at an individual level, right? Especially those units that had a kind of a company size and that were also the tactically more active uh, on the battlefield. Um, and as we were saying before, f actually we were 52 banners of the order that were captured at the Battle of Grunwald and hung in Krakow Cathedral, right? The Germans in 1940 uh, removed them and brought bringing them to Marienburg uh, after the occupation of Poland and um, what is interesting and what we will work with mostly today is the series of um, pictures we have of, of the banners that as early as 1448, so just basically um, you know, 40 years after the battle, were recorded by uh, Jan Dlugosz mm, and drawn by Stanislav Durink of Krakow right, in this uh, book entitled the Banderia Prutenorum, so the banners of, of Prussia, the banners of the Prussians, more literally, um, from which um, you know the, the, the banners we will comment today are taken. Mostly, then what you're seeing now is just random pictures of, in part of the same banners, actually, of the Battle of uh, the Battle of Tannenberg. And now we will essentially describe them. It's a bit of a different video from the usual, but I think it can be. Uh, interesting just even visually and for the short amount of information we will provide. So the first one is the greater banner of the orders Hochmeister 
where the time of the battle was Fra Ulrich von Jungingen. Uh, it is white with a gold cross outlined in black and in the center a gold shield charged with an eagle displayed sable. The hoist is blue as are those of many of the flags depicted in Trugo's book. And in addition the Hochmeister also had a lesser banner, basically a smaller version of the flag depicted except that the hoist was white, the lower edge was not split in two three tails and there was no black bar across the ends of the cross arms, uh, the gold inner cross instead reaching right to the edges of the flag. Talk, uh, talking about measure, the greater banner measured 178 centimeters per 133 mm, and the lesser banner instead um, 75 centimeters per 59 and probably they were both carried in the same division. The Lugos reference to the Hochmeister leading under the greater banner, picked man from his council plus brother knights, um, probably being an allusion to his bodyguard just fights this during the battle of Grunwald. And both flags seem to have actually been Bexilla, suspended from a crossbar, mm, as also a couple of others actually of this list uh, were. The next one is the banner of the order, a simple black cross on white. This measured instead uh, 194 centimeters per 163 centimeters. At, at Grunwald it was carried in the division commanded by Friedrich Wallenrod, the Grand Marshal of Prussia and commander of the left wing. The next one is the flag of the orders Company of St. George, under which German mercenaries in the employ of the Teutonic Knights were normally mustered, as they were at Grunwald in 1410. Um, this is very interesting because um, I'm incidentally studying uh, German mercenaries at the beginning of the 14th century, so we're basically one century before, and you see, as in other companies, that however, uh, the, the name of St. George was very, uh, very common. Right, it wasn't the only one, and as we will see now, this would even create a problems um, with other nationalities because the idea is that you know I'm the best knight, so Saint George really patronizes me, and uh, not uh, you. Like that's this kind of the concept. But it's also meaningful that mercenaryism here was the uh, the normality actually, even for such a well military structured. Um, order like the Teutonic one, even the forms of recruitment were fundamentally still th the same ones of the uh, all other medieval armies, th though it was just that the order was politically and socially better administered, but it was fundamentally the same. And German mercenaries were present naturally uh, in great numbers and regularly employed, as well as basically any other power around there, not even of being part of the Holy Roman Empire, but the neighboring countries. Um, and um, this was the this flag in the manuscript was depicted by Durink um, as a white cross on a red field with a short red tail, as you can see, which was fairly certainly a mistake though, since Dlugosh elsewhere instead, and more plausibly, uh, telling the truth, describes the banner of Saint George as a red cross on white. Um, the Teutonic Knights themselves regarded St. George as their patron saint, uh, ideally, like, um, insisting that, for, for the same reasons we have mentioned before as a uh, chivalric order at the end of the day, insisting that in, in their own land or service, importantly, um, they alone had the right to bear his flag. So this resulted, in fact, problems, for example, in with English crusading contingents that were forbidden from unfurling their own flags of St. George that, as you know, in England uh, is, is, was extremely, as much as important at least, and is recorded, um, this incident is recorded um, in 1364, in 1392. So it was this kind of competition simply seeing, you know, it, it was a matter of negotiating who was in charge there, and naturally the Teutonic Knights had this kind of iron fist waiting. 
they organize their armies and, and their their territorial control. So uh, these free mercenary companies that came simply as in fact completely independently most of the cases to serve power in another um, were definitely not liking the imposition that uh, St. Saint George's banner could be just a uh, prerogative of of these uh, of the Teutonics in this case. This is instead one of the two banners of Kulm, at the time the German city, uh, today um, the Polish city of uh, Xeumno, uh, captured at the Battle of Grunwald. This measured 178 centimeters per 187, and it um, plus it had this tail um, 193 centimeters long, pretty long. So as you see, it is uh, divided into wavy uh, white and red bands with a black border and a cross at the top of the edge. Um, and the Swabian knight who carried this flag was known as Mikolai or Nikolaus of Rennes, who would be executed by Jungingen's successor, um, according to Alan Nichols' words, displaying insufficient zeal in the battle. In fact, this guy had deserted. Mm -hmm. And the second banner differed in having a white hoist and its tail divided vertically into broad red and white stripes. In addition, it was uh, smaller and only about uh, 126 centimeters with a long tail of 119 centimeters. This is instead the banner of the Order's Grand Treasurer, who at the time of Tannenberg was Thomas Marheim. Appropriately enough, his division included many mercenaries as such, um, so naturally, you know, the, the key is the symbol, I think, here of the trunk, who you know, could open and dispense the money for hiring. So it's very important, naturally, these figures had um, not just an administrative, but political and military role as well. So as you can see, the flag is red, with a key um, in white. This is the banner of the Komtorei of Stöhm, at the time German city, today's Polish Stöhm, in fact, um, under which the Grand Commander, Kuno von Liechtenstein, fought with some Breton and many Austrian mercenaries, hmm? uh, Liechtenstein at the time being part of the Habsburging domains of uh, and hence uh, the flag in Austria's red, white, red uh, colors with a white hoist. This was a large flag. Yeah, it measured something like 178 per 187 centimeters and a sooner flag of slightly narrower proportions it was 163 centimeters per 126 um, and with the, the stripes from the top to bottom in red, white and black, with a blue hoist, was carried instead by the division of the Advocate of Lask. The Advocate of Hohenstein's um, division, having a very similar but square flag with the colors inverted instead, there was another similar flag, this time measuring uh, 163 centimeters per 147, and colored with uh, uh, in green, white, red, with the white central band slightly wider than the others, plus a white hoist, which was carried by a unit of German crusaders. This is instead the red and white banner with a blue hoist of the Komtorei of Elbing, today's Poland's uh, Elblank, uh, if I pronounce it correctly. And this was at the time the commandery of Werner von Tetlingen or Tetlingen, the great hospitaller actually, who was the only one of the order's great um, great officers to escape alive from the battle of Grunwald and being consequently disgraced for having fled the field, right, because many others actually fought to the death. But you know, he was in general ashamed to ban. In fact, the battlefield for those times, addicts, at least perceived ones, from from the sources, and um, the dimensions of this banner 
were 104 centimeters per 67 centimeters. There was another flag under which Elbing's uh, uh, visa contour fought, um, differing only in the crosses uh, being forme rather than plain. Right, so just like the one of the Iron Cross, if you have it in mind. And there was also a third one, which was the banner of the town of Elbing itself, under which the Burgomeister led citizens and mercenaries alike. So this gives you the idea of what, in fact, a normal medieval city could, could master, medieval town could master this high mercenaries, professionals in this regard, and city militia. And this third banner was identical to that depicted here, except in having the colors reversed, retaining the blue hoist dough. And curiously, the uh, Bandaria Prutonorum manuscript makes the flag of the uh, Vice Comptor's division larger than that of von Tettingen's, slightly more than half as big again which means, presumably, that this was the Comptorai's main flag, which implies Lugos got them the wrong way around, and that of the town of um, Brownsburg, in which the crosses were again for me, black and white in the top, half and white and black, in the bottom half with a grey hoist, in measuring um, I think 104 uh, centimeters and uh, 74 per 74 centimeters. Braunsberg being today's Braniev in Varmia, in the Varmian Mazurian voivodeship of Poland. Oh, this is the banner of the Komtorai of Königsberg, the commander of the Grand Marshal himself. And at Grunwald, uh, this division was led by the vice marshal. Instead, uh, the flag carries the royal arms of Bohemia: gules, a lion rampant, quewe uh, fourche, and passed in saltire argent, armed and crowned or uh, conferred on the commandery by Jean de Luxembourg king of Bohemia, in fact, whilst crusading in Prussia with the order in 1329. Let's remember that Königsberg actually was founded by the Bohemian king, Ottokar II, back in the 13th century, so the city had kind of a old ties with the Bohemian crown. Um, what you see here is the arms of the order that are displayed in chief and the hoist in red. And this flag measured about 126 centimeters per 178, including the um, Schwenkel. This is the banner of the Komtorai of Balga. Today, Balga actually in the um, Kaliningrad's uh, oblast in Russia. Um, and you here you see it's white with a red wolf with a black tongue and a black top edge which in fact may actually be the hoist the flag possibly having been hung wrongly by its Polish captors and the dimensions here 178 centimeters per 111 centimeters and it was a similar but smaller banner um, a bit, just a bit more than, than a half of, of the size the one depicted in here, which differed in its tr uh, reversal of white and red, in addition to which the wolf's tail was shown down and the hoist was colored blue. And it was carried by a body of crusading Swiss knights, and it seems likely that they were attached to this commandery, now you see basically the, the wider participations here in the events of the Baltic Crusades and th this uh, contribution from the Holy Roman Imperial lands especially to the, to the Teutonic cause. This is the banner of the Komtorai of Graudens, today's uh, Grudzians, I believe it's pronounced in uh, Poland on the Vistula River and 
the banner comprises a black bison's or bull's head on white with yellow nostrils and eyebrows and white eyes with red bags under them. Figure how similar it looks to the Swiss canton of uh, Uri uh, symbol. Um, uh, and if you look here, the nose ring horns and edges of the ears were mid gray rather than black. And this division was commanded by Wilhelm von Helfenstein during the battle. So here we have the black and white banner of the Komtorei of Althaus and Höhe, uh, the division being comprised at uh, Grunwald almost entirely of mercenaries. And the banner of the Komtorei of Osterode differed only in the substitution of red for black in the addition of a white hoist. And these two divisions were commanded by Wilhelm von Ippenburg and Konrad von Pinsenau, respectively. Uh, there was another flag, that of a unit of um, Misnian knights, um, which had the quarters instead in red and blue, and again, um, also with a white hoist. And both flags measured 111 um, centimeters per 133 centimeters. Ragnet, by the way, is the um, German for Neman in today's um, Russia, in the Kaliningrad uh, Oblast. This banner is from the Komtorei of Ragnet. Uh, it is white with three hats, as you see, that Tlugosh blazoned as Pile hmm, in red. And a second identical banner is attributed to the Bishop of Zambia, Zamland, um, a man at arms and mercenaries of the bishopric fighting under it specifically. Um, it seems likely that these hats were carried both on fl um, both flags actually, and that and they're also described as uh, meters and hel helmets, right? So it bears as a uh, kind of headgear, even armor, and were probably representation of some Egyptians for caps. Mm -hmm. And both flags, in this case, measured 147 centimeters for 133. This banner is uh, attributed to the Bishop of Kulmland, but is more likely to belong to the Bishop of Zambia. And it is white, with a blue hoist, and a sword and crook in red. The measures are 137 centimeters per 133. This is instead a banner, probably wrongly attributed to the Komtorei of Schlochau, today's um, uh, Schluchkov, I, I think it's pronounced, in the Voivodate of Pomerania in, in Poland. And um, the, the lower portion, as you see, is white as the hoist um, with the Agnus Dei. Goblet, halo and standard in white on a red background and in measured something like 133 uh, per 104 centimeters with a Schwenkel of 89 centimeters, you can see up uh, right. Um, and a very similar flag is more credibly recorded being carried at the head of a contingent provided by the Bishop of Varmia Ermland, um, though it differs in such subtle details as having a raid hoist, a solid halo behind the lamb's hand, a flag which is wholly attached to the staff and bears a cross, a deeper white band and a shorter schwenkel of 90 centimeters. This is one of two identical banners instead under which the men of the Komtorei of Danzig, hmm? Gdansk itself, fought one division being under the Komtur, Johann von Schoenfeld, the other being under the Weisskomtur. And it is white with a black diagonal band. And both banners seem to have measured um, 111 for 147 uh, centimeters uh, with tails uh, of up to actually 100 
uh, nine, uh, 119 centimeters long. Um, and the troops sent by the town of Danzig included a large number of hard bitten seamen, hmm, which fought under a flag like that of the Vice Comptor of Elbing, that we have described before, differing only in both the crosses being white on an undivided red field. This is instead the banner of the Comtorei of Meve, today's Niev, in um, Poland, on Vistula, the Pomeranian voivode ship. Um, under, um, and under this banner, many German mercenaries fought in the Battle of Grunwald at the command of Johann Graf von Bende. The arrows, one of them uh, a bird bolt, are in white on a red field. Virtually the same design. With the colors reversed, though, also appears on the flag of a unit of German crusaders who were therefore probably attached to Meve. Um, and the latter measured uh, 119 centimeters square, being slightly deeper and narrower. This is the banner of Engelsburg, um, today's Pogrivno. I believe in um, it's a district of Gmina Gruta of in the Kuyavian Pomeranian void of a ship. Um, this mm, banner represents the white angel with brown hair and face hands proper on a red field. Commander of this division, Grunwald, was Burkhard Wobeck, the order's grand drapier. This is the banner of the town and advocate of Eiligenbeil. It is black with a white axe and a white band at the top edge, which in another flag, that of the advocate of Bartenstein, extends into a Schwenkel. The latter flag also differs in having no shaft above the socket of the axe plus a blue hoist and is also a few inches bigger uh, than the one which was um, something like 119 inches square. This is the banner of the advocate of Bratian and Neumarkt, who was Johann von Redern, white with conjoined antlers in brown. This is the banner of the Comtorei of Nijava. As you see, the stripes are black, white, black, and a similar flag, that of the advocate in town of Dirschau, had four stripes instead, black, white, black, white, plus a grey hoist, and it measured something like 147 centimeters per 127 centimeters. Commanders of these two divisions at Battle Grunwald were Gottfried von Atzfeld, and Matthias von Bebern. This is the banner of the Komtorei of Ortelsburg, today's um, Schiet Schietno, I believe, in, in Polish. Um, um, this was led at the Battle of Grunwald by its commander, Albert von Etschburg. Um, it is red over white with a blue hoist, and it measured 133 centimeters per 163 centimeters was a second identical banner, differing only in having a white hoist and being um, some 10 centimeters shorter, um, something less perhaps, um, because it's depicted in fact in Dlugos' book itself. Um, there was capture instead of the Battle of Koronovo on October the 10th, for uh, still 1410, where the new Hochmeister, Harry von Plauen, was defeated by a Polish army, allegedly only half of the size of his own. This one is instead the banner of one of the Teutonic Order Polish allies at the Battle of Grunwald, belonging to Kazimir V, Duke of Stettin in Pomerania, who led 600 men at arms in ba in to battle and was taken prisoner in it. Uh, as you see, it's white um, and um, with a blue hoist, and it displays a red griffin with yellow talons and beak. 
and he measured 104 centimeters for 111. Talking about the last three banners, so these were all Livonian hmm, that were captured at the Battle of Nacco in 1431. Later on, and uh, here I haven't found them all, especially the one with the Virgin and the Child attached to the uh, the one we comment now. Um, but essentially, well, I haven't, I haven't put it put them in order. But substantially, the one with the uh, with the knight that you see, I think, displayed now, yes, um, is um, the the side uh, one side of the Landmeister of Livonia's flag, um, comprising from one side the Black Saint Morris, as you see here in blue steel armor and white cloak and surcoat on a white background with his halo crown belt langs planes and cutter all, all in gold so here we get actually pretty good depiction of what um, an armor of the time looked like of course it's kind of there is some artistical license but it's the same of course elite level of elite armor uh, at the time you see um, also and this is it. And on the other side it was the Livonian Mother of God device with Mary in blue uh, gown over a white shift. And I've inserted it here now, um, but it's I, I don't think it's the original one, although here you see still the banner. And it's not in color either, but it's the only one I've found of some uh, reference to this. And um, you see uh, basically Mary here would be represented with a blue gown over a uh, white shift with sanity the hallows of crown and gold the flesh and hair proper all in white background mm. and the uh, escut de chien, uh, and Saint Maurice shield bear the arms of the Teutonic order both figures stand on green grass mm. and this flag measured 111 centimeters square so they're both squares, uh, being part of two sides of the same banner. Um, uh, the m there are there is this other flag, which is, as you see here, with two stars, which um, with stars in white, and possibly the banner of other Comtorai um, of Ascheraden or, or that of Dunaburg, since both their commanders fought under this. Uh, the, the same banner and similarly the black and white uh, flag depicted um, later on here was um, belonged to either the Comtorai of Fellin or the wine of Kurland though there is a second identical flag captured at the battle that was carried in that division commanded by the advocate of Kokenhausen um, this um, measures 119 for 128 centimeters and it had tails of 59 centimeters and its counterpart being smaller so this is it uh, quite simply I just wanted to show you these flags and um, you've seen how you know composite really the uh, the same Teutonic army at the Battle of Grunwald could be in terms of you know um, different uh, communities that participated to it, some very close, pri same Prussian control, um, others coming from far away, as far as Sw Switzerland, for example. Um, and the the art, as you see, is kind of also similar to um, the one you see in other banners and flags throughout all of Europe, but naturally there is a more marked uh, symbolism towards the colors that are somewhat similar to each other, black, white, uh, red, etc. that figure prominently on the Teutonic Order's uh, banners. Um, the, uh, the interesting part of this is that, if in fact, these flags were preserved and we have the lack of knowing what they, they really looked like on this occasion. And this was the normality at the time. Right? All the others naturally preserved their own own banners, but we know less about them. Uh, I don't know about the existing documentation, about the 
Teutonic orders uh, administrator, but you don't often find this stuff because simply these um, banners belong to different communities that were kind of autonomous on their own, so they dealt with their own banners on, on their own, largely. At the beginning we have seen how even the order naturally distributed part of these banners. It doesn't the, the Livonian Chronicle, I think, there doesn't specify whether they, the Teutonics decided what they, they had these guys had to display. They naturally probably had all their own previous um, kind of identities and symbolisms, etc. So they, they would progressively adapt them. Um, but this is a very interesting case. This was done all the time. I mean, the victorious army essentially seizing the, the enemy banners as the greatest glory of the battle. Right, the banner had to be defended to the death. This this is the concept. This is not just an ancient ideal. This is it was also medieval, and it kept go going on. It, it's true still today, right? Because it's the spirit of the unit embodying that that flag, and naturally also uh, it, it's same cohesion for reasons of communication of you know knowing where the unit is in the first place. So seizing it means that you have really annihilated the, the enemy unit. It's not a health victory for which the enemy has retreated in some good order, has preserved its banners. No, you have taken them. And the first thing they do is they offer this, say, to the deity, to the divinity. This stuff was showed, uh, was ha was to decorate the uh, the cathedral of Krakow, right? So a great, um, a great honor for the Polish, the Lithuanians. Um, yeah, and then you can find this pretty easily elsewhere. Think about the Battle of Courtrai, where the, uh, the, the the town, the burghers of um, of Bruges uh, uh, take this to the church of of Courtrai, that the dedicated to to Mary, right? Uh, or the all the banners of the peasants after the naval battle of the Meloria brought back to Genoa. So this was absolutely normal. Uh, it's just that some of these stuff is not preserved. And in this case, we have a you know, big uh, victory, let's say. So, um, this all this great celebration, also all the through the recording of what the actual banners were, right? And this is very important. And eventually, these same banners were actually survived over time, uh, as we have seen. And but but it's also interesting to confront the documentation, also to understand how much the orders understood. W I mean, with the actual finds, because to to understand how much the orders fundamentally uh, realized that they were how informed how where they were but this is another topic and I, I would say stop here for today and I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please uh, share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye